Just when it looked like the New York Mets were going to go down in a brutal doubleheader sweep where their offense just produced nothing, Pete Alonso delivered with one swing of the bat, saving the Mets and helping deliver their first win of the season. I'll break down everything from the doubleheader on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to PrizePicks.com. Slash locked on MLB and use the code all in lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. We are finally living the roller coaster where there's actually ups as well as downs throughout a season, and you understand just how quickly the mood of an entire fan base can change on a dime because the Mets were spiraling, spiraling, and spiraling into deeper and deeper destruction and disaster, and it was torture and and people just wanted to end this season. Mets fans were already ready to tune out on this team because it felt like a continuation of last year. And here are things that are still true. When Francisco Alvarez hit an RBI double in the third inning of game one, that broke a 19-inning scoreless streak by the Mets. When Harrison Bader in game two flared a base hit to start off the eighth inning, that broke a 13-inning hitless streak. Both of those things happened today. And in this series, I guess even the score of the streaks stretching beyond that to the last one, this offense has been brutal. But with one swing of the bat by Pete Alonso, with a game-winning hit by Tyrone Taylor in that second game, and the Mets finally getting a victory and putting one in the win column, everything can shift that quickly. Now, will momentum carry over? We'll find that out in Cincinnati this weekend. But it is really insane just how quickly those emotions can change. Because this was going to be another just frustration podcast. Everyone air out how mad you are. You're driving to work, listening to me talk about how mad I am, which helps you because you're mad. And we're all venting together. We're calling our friends. We're texting our buddies. Like, this sucks. This is awful. I can't believe this team. Here we go again. And then Pete Alonzo can, with one swing of the bat, change it all. And that's what makes baseball so ridiculously unique and special and frustrating, all wrapped into a single package. Let's talk about that that arc of the day, how everything sort of transpired. Because game one, it felt like the Mets were finally going to get a win. Francisco Alvarez, as I mentioned, has an RBI double. Great piece of hitting. We're seeing a more complete hitter this year. Last year, it was all or nothing. This year, yeah, he's going to eventually you know, get into more of the power and hit some more home runs. So those will come. But he is, in certain situations, just looking to get the hit. And I think we've seen that from Brett Beatty, too. At times, I think a prospect comes up, and they're so concerned with just putting the best possible swing on the baseball and, and, and having those exit velocities and driving it and trying to hit home runs and put runs on the board that way, instead of just, you know, taking what the pitcher gives them and, and being a hitter and those little hits that you get, that's what, you know, drives up your average, your OPS, all of it, because instead of striking out in those moments or, or flying out, whatever it is, instead taking what the, the team gives you or what the, the pitcher gives you, allows you to open up so much for yourself. And so Alvarez, we've seen him you know, hit balls up the middle. We've seen him go the other way. And in this case, he rips one down the third baseline. That drives in Francisco Lindor and Pete Alonso, And the Mets have a 2 nothing lead. And Adrian Hauser is throwing the ball well. He did get very fortunate at one point in the game. I will note he walked a couple guys. Uh, a, a ground ball, I believe it was, put them in scoring position. So he's sitting there, one out. 
two guys in, in, in scoring position. Could have got really dicey. And I think it was Colt Keith, but don't quote me on that. Regardless, a Tiger rips a line drive that ends up in Francisco Lindor's glove. Riley Green did a really bad job on the bases there, standing on second, started making a break towards third on a line drive that was hit right at him. Should have known better that Lindor was there. He gets doubled off. That was a huge moment for Hauser, but still, he, he got through five without giving up any runs. It, it just seemed like, all right, the Mets are, are cruising here. It was about time. It's going to be a nice, easy win. Hauser's going to hand this thing off to the bullpen. The bullpen's going to get the job done. No worries. Well, Hauser ends up giving up a couple base runners to go to Brooks Raley. Raley gives up a sacrifice fly, so Hauser does get charged with one run. Seventh inning comes around. Mets give up another run. And I think, I'm trying to remember who that was. That was the, the Jake Deakman run. Um, also, Drew Smith. I think he got charged to Smith. Smith let on a couple of base runners. Deakman came in to try to get him out of the jam facing lefties. Threw a couple of pass balls. Run came to score. That was it. So the Mets still had a lead. But then Adam Adovino comes on in the eighth inning. Margins tight. The offense has fallen off again. He gives up a home run to Riley Green. Tie ball game. At that point, you're thinking, these same old Mets again. Are you kidding me? They can't get the job done. There was a brutal at bat that we're going to talk about in the next segment here in the 10th inning with Brett Beatty because we're going to spend a lot of time on Beatty in the next segment. We'll get to it. For, for those of you who watched the game, you know what I'm talking about. It was surrounding asking Beatty to bunt, but I, I want to talk about that more at length in a minute here. Uh, but bottom line is the Mets just can't score. They don't score through 10. 11th inning comes around. This is after Edwin Diaz had pitched in the ninth. Jorge Lopez did a great job in that 10th inning to strand the ghost runner, to give you a chance with a runner on second base and nobody out to win the game, and you couldn't do it. 11th inning, once again, it's Michael Tonkin on the mound, who was on the mound when the Mets gave up five runs in extra innings in game one of this series, all the way back on Monday. He's on the mound again, three runs scored. Now, Tonkin, how much you want to blame him or not, we'll see what happens with Tonkin. I'm not going to get into his pitching up to this point. I think he has been put in some rough spots here. He did give up a, a double that scored a couple there. So Tonkin obviously is probably an enemy among some Mets fans right now. He has been on the mound for a couple disastrous losses or two disastrous losses in this series. But it brings me to bottom of the 11th of that first game. Two runners were on for Pete Alonso. He had a chance to tie the game with one swing of the bat. Couldn't get it done. Struck out. So game one ends. Game two, the Mets get incredible work from Jose Budo and Reed Garrett. Budo, he went from uh, nearly throwing 50 pitches in the first two innings and really laboring, and it seemed like he wasn't going to be able to give this team the length that they needed, to then needing only 41 pitches for the next four innings where he did not allow a run in those final four innings. Allowed one run across six innings pitched, three hits allowed, three walks, six strikeouts. A great outing by Jose Budo. And then Reed Garrett, who's probably heading off the roster here soon, uh, you know, because he was that extra man that came up when Johan Ramirez um, you know, got suspended. So Garrett is just there probably for you know this one game. He gives them that's 45 pitches, gets them through three scoreless out of the bullpen, and gives them a chance in that ninth inning where the Mets are trailing by one run. But the offense had done nothing. And so up to that point, you could say, man, Budo threw the ball well. Reed Garrett had just survived those three, getting through it and giving the Mets this shot, but they're not going to score. And Pete Alonso comes up, and he gets a pitch. I actually did pull this for the show for the YouTube audience here. Look at where Pete Alonso hits this changeup. He digs this thing out of the ground, basically. And not only that, it was a three-quarter swing. Pete Alonso is so bleeping strong that he was able to get a barrel on that thing, hit it over 100 miles per hour off the bat, 400 feet to right center and, or excuse me, left center. And just somehow, I cannot believe he hit that ball out. It was a remarkable home run by Pete Alonso. And just another one of those moments where you realize how valuable this guy is because when all else fails and the offense is completely in the mud, this is the guy that time and again can change any game 
with one mighty swing. And that's what he did. And you saw the entire dugout relax. The tension was just released in one moment. Brett Beatty comes up. He was fired up. He was sitting on the on deck circle for the home run. Jumps up, you know, pounds uh, Alonzo's arm as they as they go through the forearm smash. Fired up, gets into the box, puts together a great at bat, draws a walk. You know, as he's going to first base, he's yelling to the dugout. He's feeling himself, which is great. Starling Marte lays down a bunt. They have a runner in scoring position, and Tyrone Taylor gets the job done and gets the knock. Line drive into left field down the third base line. Brett Beatty comes around to score. The Mets get a win. And again, on a dime, everything can change that quickly. And I hope this is the type of win where momentum can carry over. Howie Rose on the radio broadcast was talking about the 2005 Mets. That was the first year of Willie Randolph's tenure managing the team. Now they started off 0-5. It's the only other time in franchise history outside of the first three years of this franchise's existence where the Mets have started off 0-5. And apparently in that game, the sixth game, John Smoltz was throwing a gem, had wasted 15 strikeouts or something crazy. And how do you say it? Was it – how did he say – I think Beltron hit a home run. A two-run homer, the Mets won 2-1. to one. And they went on to win the next five games, and they were over 500 at, you know, through 11. Not to say history will exactly repeat itself here, but – Sometimes it just takes that one game. And I think that's what all Mets fans are hoping for, that this game, that turnaround, the comeback in that ninth inning led by Pete Alonso, that eventually Tyrone Taylor, that the Mets can relax and start to hit in this upcoming series. But we can't ignore how bad they've been. So I want to discuss the offensive struggle still a little bit in the next segment. But also I want to spend a lot of time on Brett Beatty because – I think he played a fantastic doubleheader today, particularly defensively, but also key moments with the bat. So we're going to get into that in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Factor Meals. Eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready-to-eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Calorie Smart Keto Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie. Also, you can discover 60 add-ons every week, like breakfast, on-the-go lunch, snacks, and beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day. Personally, for me, Factor just makes my life easy. You, you eliminate all the different uh, hassle with, with cooking and, and you know, having to clean up your dishes after you cook and just the time spent. Instead, it's just two minutes. Poke some holes in it, pop it in the microwave. You're golden. You can tailor your schedule around factor customize your weekly meals with flexibility to get you as much or as little as you need you can pause or reschedule deliveries to suit your lifestyle so if you go out of town you can pause it come back you just reschedule get things going again if you want to try factor meals head to factormeals.com slash locked on mlb 50 and use the code locked on mlb 50 to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent off your next box that's code locked on mlb 50 at factormeals.com slash locked on mlb 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Today's episode is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players, where you just pick more or less than on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. With the Mets season going on, you could pick more or less on any of the Mets stars. Maybe you believe Francisco Lindor is due. Planning in Great American Small Park, he might hit his first home run tonight. You can go more on the home runs, or if you think no chance he's even going to hit it out or even get hits, take less on those stats. Uh, there's also strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, and you can combine a player like Lindor with someone in the NBA, like LeBron James, on the same play. That's what makes prize picks so fun. There are a wide selection of players. They also offer quick withdrawals. It's easy gameplay. This is what makes Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. And they also offer weekly promotions and special offers for the biggest moments in sports. Download the app today and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the Prize Picks app. Use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. 
since the Mets won, I'm in a good mood. So before we talk about the anemic offense, let's go through Brett Beatty's day. He had a fantastic doubleheader, in my opinion. I mean, we saw a leaping catch in the top of the 10th inning of game one. We saw him make a great backhand play. We saw him in the 11th inning of that first game also have a ball that hit off his glove. He stayed with it, made a strong throw home in a first and third situation where they had to get a tag play at the plate, and they did. They did get that out after it. Runs came in. That's not Beatty's fault. We're really seeing a player mature in front of our eyes. That's what it feels like. He's coming into his own, and you look at the offensive numbers. One for two in the first game before that at bat in the 10th inning with an RBI and two walks. He was really looking good at the dish. The reason why I focus on those first four at-bats before I get into the fifth one that happened in extra innings is because it was the worst piece of managing I have seen so far this season. If you go back to 2019, I was frequently ripping Mickey Calloway and nitpicking all of his different decisions. And I've tried to get away from that because what I think happens as a fan is you watch Pete Alonso hit that home run or strike out. You can't do what Pete does in the box. You could be a manager. You could make decisions in a dugout. Now, really, you couldn't actually do that job as far as all the interpersonal relationships you have to have and all the other stuff that goes into being a manager. But from our couch, we feel like, when a manager makes a bad call, we should have done something better. We we could have made a better decision. So I try to stay away from criticizing managers too much because ultimately it's the players. As much as we wanted to praise Buck Showalter when he was manager of the year and the Mets won 101 games, it was the exact same guy that had the same approach who had the Mets at 75 wins last year and through a disaster of a season. With that said, sometimes a mistake is so glaring you have to point it out. Brett Beatty comes up to bat in the bottom of the 10th inning in a tie game with a runner on second base. Of course, that's the ghost runner. No outs. They try to get him to bunt. Why would they try to get Brett Beatty to bunt in that spot? Now, you could say a run scores it. It, it, it. You know, a run wins the game. A run scores it. A run wins the game. So if he gets that bunt down, the runner's on third base, sack fly, you win. I understand. I get that part of the strategy. But you have to know your players. And Brett Beatty was a top 20 prospect in all of baseball, which means as a top five prospect throughout his entire time, basically, in the Mets organization, he was always batting right in the middle of the lineup, typically third. How often do you ask your third hitter to lay down a bunt? You think Brett Beatty was bunting in travel or high school when he was probably hitting like 500? No. So it's something he's never really done. Granted, you can criticize that he should learn. Obviously, everyone should round out their game. But this was a moment where Brett Beatty could have won the game with a base hit. And if you watched his play throughout the game, he was one of the guys you'd want to actually try to deliver there. The only guys that looked good in the box were Pete Alonzo, Brett Beatty, and Francisco Alvarez, really. So he's standing there with a chance to win the game with one swing, just, just get a base hit. And you ask him to bunt. And the worst part of that is he's a lefty. If Brett Beatty rolls one over, you're going to get the exact same result. The runner's going to end up on third base. Let him take a normal at-bat with situational hitting in mind. He knows that he's got to try to pull something to that right side of the infield. But to ask him to bunt was just a horrible decision. He looks awful trying. He ends up in an 0-2 hole. He strikes out. And then the inning ends up ending pretty pretty soon after that. So it, it was just really frustrating, that part of it. Um, and so I said I wasn't going to criticize. Here we are criticizing that one at bat, but it just it was brutal. It was, it was a brutal decision, and I think it cost them that first game. They should have won that first game, and I think if they let Brett Beatty hit, I'm not saying he definitely would have got a knock, but he certainly would have um, had a much better chance of moving that runner over even than asking him to butt. With that said, that brings us to game two. He goes 0 for 3 in game 2, but he draws a walk in that big spot and scores the game-winning run. So far this year, Brett Beatty has an OPS a little over 700. I think it's in the 720 range. I didn't mark that in my notes here, but I believe it's it's somewhere in the 720s. Um, I think it's 722 off the top of my head. But what's interesting is he's 2 for 4 against left-handed pitching with a home run in all four 
of his RBIs. Now, he had the three-run homer, and he had the knock today that drove in the run in the first game. Against righties, he's two for 14. I'm not worried about it. He doesn't look bad in the box by any stretch. But also, you have the fact that he looks really solid defensively. And I think he's playing himself into everyday playing time. Have him start versus lefties is what I'm saying. Now, when Andrew Abbott pitches in the final game of this series in Cincinnati, could Zach Short be the starting third baseman? Would I be surprised at all if that was the day the Mets chose to get Short on the field? No. Even with how good Beatty has fared against left-handed pitching so far this year. I'm sure they'll still go to that well a little bit. But particularly with the way he's defending, the fact that he is certainly not a liability over there, and he's starting to look like at least somewhat of an asset. He has a really strong arm that he's using well, and he's in the right spot. He's he's doing everything right at this point from, from my vantage point. that He is looking like a quality big league third baseman. That raises his floor so much about getting him into the lineup. And then there's so much more upside with Brett Beatty, not only just for this year, but of course, long-term. This guy could be your third baseman for the next six years on an affordable contract. And so to see the progression from Beatty and also Alvarez having this superstar-esque leap here, those have been the best two takeaways I think that we could have from this season up to this point as far as the offensive side of things. Now let's get to the downside of it. They were two for 17 with runners in scoring position in game one. Just atrocious. Game two, they were one for three because they just weren't getting runners in scoring position. So far this year, the Mets are hitting 173. That is the worst mark in all of baseball. They're averaging between five and six hits per game. That's not a lot. That's you know, There's nine guys in your starting lineup. That means you know, two-thirds of them might get one hit. And a third of them is going hitless and no one's getting the multi-hit games, regardless of how you want to break up those hits. You should be averaging nine hits a game, something like that. Like that, that that's a good offense when you're consistently even getting to double digits. That's how you know that you have a well-oiled machine on offense. The Mets have not had that. And you look at why Omer Navarro, DJ Stewart, Joey Wendell, that's your bench basically here. They're combined 0 for 21. Zach Short, the other member of the bench has only had that one start. He's one for three. I also will note, Zach Short came into the game uh, after Harrison Bader got a hit in the eighth inning. Uh, I think he was hitting for, was it Joey Wendell? I think it was for Joey Wendell. But he laid down a perfect textbook bunt. Mendoza, if you want a bunt in that spot, I'm not going to knock you for it. But pinch hit Zach Short, who has experience being you know, a, a end of the lineup bat, who's used to bunting, who can go in there and get that job done for you. But I digress on that situation. Moving back to this offense. So like I said, 0 for 21 for Nervaya, Stewart, Wendell. If you want to include short, 1 for 24. With eight strikeouts, five of them coming from Stewart. He has been awful. Tyrone Taylor and Harrison Bader. They're combined 6 for 29 with nine strikeouts, two walks, two RBIs. Both the walks and the RBIs are courtesy of Taylor. I think he's mo- looked much better in the box. I'm not just saying that because he had the game-winning hit. Against right-handed pitching, he looks like he's in attack mode, and I like what I see. Bader looks really tentative against right-handed pitching. So I, I could see him playing himself into the short side of the platoon not too long into this season where we're just seeing Bader as the fourth outfitter who starts against lefties because he has not looked good against right-handed pitching. But here's the real problem. Jeff McNeil, Brandon Immo, and Francisco Lindor. The three of them are all individually hitting under 100. And combined, they are three for 60. That's three of your main hitters who are combined to have a batting average of .050. They're hitting 50. 50. They're only a quarter of the way to the Mendoza line. They're not even sniffing it. That's actually a new meaning now. Mendoza line with Mendoza as the manager. His team's under it by a lot. So this offense has to start clicking for them to win games, which is an obvious statement, but still one worth mentioning. they got to figure this thing out. And J.D. Martinez isn't coming to save the day on his white horse on Sunday. He might be there in Atlanta, but he's not going to be there in Cincy. It's a great ballpark to hit in, and I'm you know, very intrigued to watch this lineup now 
They go on the road for the first time, which also could be a good thing for this team. Get away from Mets fans. Get away from that ballpark, the pressure. You ended on a good note. So vibes are going to be much better on that plane flight than if they were 0-6. You head into Cincinnati, and hopefully what we see are particularly Nimmo, Lindor, McNeil. Those three start to pull their weight. Because if they do, and really if they just tip the scales back to their their career means or their averages, all of a sudden they'll have to get hot because of how slow they've been. So we could see a, a series or two series, hopefully, where those guys figure things out. You still get some production from Pete Alonso, of course. Alvarez might come back down to earth a little bit. I don't know how, how, how long he's going to hit. Well over 300. We'll see. But that that's really what has to happen is those three guys got to step up. And then the rest, they have to chip in a little bit more. You can't have you know, three guys on your team who have gotten a significant significant enough amount of bats, 21 at-bats in six games. That's you know, basically a spot in the lineup going 0 for 21. I mean, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. And even the Taylor Bader thing, that, that third outfield spot, that the Mets are going to be pretty weak offensively there unless those guys step up a little bit, or maybe who knows uh, when either, and if another infielder steps up, let's say a Zach short starts hitting, maybe Jeff McNeil needs to be in the outfield and no needs to be back in center. They're going to have to figure this out throughout the season that JD Martinez will provide a lift, but he can't do it all himself. A lot of these guys have to be a lot better. So That'll be all discussing the offense, but there's still a series to preview. So we're going to get to that to close out the show here. The Mets playing in Cincinnati against the Reds. I'll talk about the pitching matchups in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Robin Hood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still earn an IRA? Robin Hood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robin Hood Gold. But get this. Now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right. No cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offers good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member of SIPC is a registered broker dealer. The New York Mets will try to keep the good vibes rolling as they head into Cincinnati to square off against a Reds team that is 4-2 this year, starting off their season with a little mini tour of the NL East. First, they played the Nationals. That series was in Cincinnati, so they've already had their home opener, and they won 2-3. Then they went to Philadelphia and beat the Phillies 2-3. So they have a nice little start to their season, and offensively, They've been really good. They've scored at least six runs in four of their six games. They've scored at least four runs in all six of their games. The Mets, meanwhile, have only scored more than four runs once. That was the second game of the season where Luis Severino gave up all those early runs, and the Mets came back but fell just short, losing seven to six. Speaking of that game, there was an error charge to Zach, or excuse me, there was a hit that has now been changed to an error charge to Zach Short, where Short was coming in on that ball at third base booted it, they ruled it an infield hit, and by having that one change, Luis Severino's ERA has gone from over 10 to 5.40. Cut his ERA in half, uh, it's because three earned runs came off of his ledger. With that said, there was a lot of people throwing around the stats that the Mets had the best ERA as a team in the National League, the third best in all of baseball. Right now, their ERA is 2.37, which is excellent. Here's where that number is a little bit deceiving, though. We talked all offseason about run prevention, right? How the Mets were signing all these guys so they could be better at preventing runs. They have allowed 11 unearned runs this year. So their run average per game is actually 4.1, which is not nearly the elite number as the 2.37. So a product of your bad defense is that it has helped your team ERA. 
Obviously, it's hurt the runs they've allowed, but you, know, you see Michael Tonkin give up five runs uh, in the extra innings, and none of them get charged to him. That's not all the defense's fault either. The Mets are getting fortunate with how it's being ruled. I will say the pitching overall has been good, though. Jose Quintana threw the ball pretty well his first time out. Uh, Tyler McGill, Adrian Hauser, solid starts. Not amazing, but solid. And then Shaman I was great. Severino is the only guy that I think has had a bad start. When it comes to the bullpen, it's been a little bit more hit or miss, but Edwin Diaz, Brooks Raley, they look really solid. Uh, Drew Smith has had his moments, although today gave up a couple base runners. Jorge Lopez, really been a nice find up to this point. Uh, Jake Diekman got a little wild today, but overall I like his stuff. So I, I think the bullpen is actually in a nice spot and they can go into a series and they can compete if they get some good starts this weekend. It's going to be Quintana versus Hunter green game one on Friday night. Uh, Hunter green is the ace of the reds young fireballer throws the ball really hard. I guess Frankie Montes started the season on opening day. Uh, but Green, I think, is effectively more of an ace for them as far as the stuff that he possesses. We'll see what it looks like in, in this start against the Mets, but um, he is definitely a tough matchup. He throws the ball really hard. Game two, Luis Severino versus Nick Martinez. Martinez was with the Padres in a swingman role the last couple of years, now getting a chance to start for the Reds. Uh, first start didn't go great. ZRA was over five, I believe, right there with Severino. Uh, so both guys probably looking to bounce back here. I like Seve in that matchup. I really do. And, and the, the Green versus Quintana matchup, Green's probably the higher upside pitcher, but Quintana can battle him for sure. And then you get to the final matchup, Sean Mania versus Andrew Abbott. Battle of two lefties. I like Mania with the way he threw the ball last time. So I look at these pitching matchups, and I feel like the Mets might have maybe not an edge, but they're certainly not in a complete deficit. It's not opening day where it was – um, you know, Freddie Peralta going up against Quintana. This is more of a level playing field. The problem is just that offensive difference, right? The Reds have a much better offense, but the Mets are maybe due for a big offensive explosion of a series. Now, J.D. Martinez, as I mentioned to you before, will not be joining the team this Sunday. They've left the door open that he could be part of that series against the Braves. If you remember when the Mets signed him and they said they were going to option him to the minor leagues, I did say I think he'll be there for Monday against the Braves in Atlanta. We'll see. We'll see if they actually go to him in that spot. They got to get him running on the bases, continue to give him some game action. He's going to get into a series somewhere this weekend in the minor leagues. I think where he plays will be indicative of where he uh, makes his debut. So we'll see. If J.D. Martinez is going to play for the St. Lucie Mets this weekend, to me that tells me he's going to end up in Atlanta. The reason I say that, because the commute there from St. Lucie to Atlanta, pretty easy. If they send him to Syracuse or to Binghamton or to Brooklyn, wherever, you know, somewhere up in the Northeast, I think the thought might be give him a week in the minor leagues. Have him return in front of Mets fans next Friday, April 12th against the Royals. So I'd either say Monday against the Braves or Friday against the Royals is my guess. I'm hoping it's Monday. Um, you know, even 75% of J.D. Martinez when it comes to the rust is better than most of this lineup right now. I think the one, I guess, element of it that's more important than anything, though, is the health. If he's not ready to go when it comes to the health, don't risk it. Take your time. You want him healthy for this full season. The Mets desperately need that bat in the middle of their lineup. But for now, this same team that we've watched the last two series is going to have to go into Cincinnati try to compete against the Reds. And then there's that brave series looming. You want to win this series. You win this series. At least you take two or three. You're sitting at what? Three and six going into Atlanta. And then you hope you can split and, and you know come out of that in at least somewhat decent shape. But if you lose this series in Cincinnati and the vibes end up back where they were prior to that ninth inning today in the game two, and then you carry that into Atlanta, you can get, completely destroyed by the Braves and the Mets could be sitting in a hole in the middle of April. That just looks insurmountable. Obviously it's a long season, but crucial games this weekend against the Reds. If the New York Mets keep the good times rolling tonight, I may just hop on and do another podcast for a Saturday show. Uh, otherwise I'll be back on Monday. So if you don't want to miss any of that and you are listening on the audio side, follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, 
hit that subscribe button. We're trying to make a push to 9,000 subs. So I appreciate all of you who subscribe. But follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, you can find the link in the episode description. Uh, thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listener, your first watch every day. Now for your second watch, head over to YouTube for the first ever 24-7 streaming channel that covers everything in the world of sports. Of course, I'm talking about Locked On Sports today with our local host from each team and our league-wide hosts from each league. If I locked on sports today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube.